All right, let's continue talking about stereotypes, prejudice, and discrimination. And let's wrap up this chapter by talking about a few other ways that we can reduce these problems. Let's start by talking about shared identities. We often recategorize outgroup members after working with them to achieve superordinate goals. We've talked about superordinate goals before. These are goals that can only be achieved when we cooperate with other people. So consider this football team. It began, of course, with two basic groups of people, as you see in this picture, black kids and white kids. And they came together because they both love football. And then what happened over time is that in order to achieve their goal of being a football team and being successful, they had to rely on each other. They had to work together. And eventually they came to recategorize themselves. They no longer saw each other as members of various outgroups. They saw themselves as members of the same group, as teammates, as friends. So these are now common identities that they share. And that's what the common in-group identity model is all about. What happens is that recategorization helps create a common in-group identity. So no longer are they seeing themselves as two separate groups and each group seeing the other as an out-group, but they're seeing themselves as one cohesive group and they're all members of that same in-group. Recategorization is really a, a great process. Recategorization helps improve intergroup attitudes and also intergroup relations. Now, as great as recategorization can be, sometimes it can lead to problems, particularly for groups that are somewhat smaller for minorities. So recategorization in these cases can lead members of smaller groups to fear losing their unique identities. Think about immigrants. Although they desperately want to be Americans, they don't want to lose that unique identity that they have, such as being Latinos or Italians or Germans, whatever it might be. But what's great is that in these situations, they can create a dual identity. So instead of simply recategorizing themselves as American, they can recategorize themselves as Italian Americans or Latino Americans or German Americans. So this allows them to preserve their in-group as still being Italians or Latinos while continuing to now have an in-group as Americans. And kind of the really neat thing about it as well is they have this new in-group that they've created, Italian Americans or Latino Americans. So it's another form of mental gymnastics that allows us to recategorize ourselves, recategorize our social situation to fit our needs. In general, our minds are flexible enough to allow us to adapt positively to nearly any situation, but we really need to be aware of and open to those possibilities. And as social strategists, we might need to help some people understand what their options are. All right, well, we're going to talk about several things in this particular section. So let's switch gears and talk about some ways in which we can reduce stereotype threat. You might recall that stigmatized people can experience profound negative effects when they worry about confirming other people's stereotypes. So for example, African-American people might worry about confirming negative stereotypes regarding their intelligence. And this threat of confirming that stereotype can lead them to worry and get distracted and that can have a significant effect on their academic performance. This is particularly likely to happen when a black student is vastly outnumbered by students who are white. But right now we're trying to focus on ways to fix these problems, and the good news is that some small changes can reduce stereotype threat. Let's talk about that. The key is establishing trust and confidence. One way to establish trust is to ensure that there are fair procedures and that there are no extra hurdles for minority students. It's also important to convey confidence in anybody's ability to achieve as long as they work hard. Now keep in mind, stereotype threat can affect lots of different groups of people. We're not just always talking about African Americans in this situation. I teach stat classes and I often deal with students who are adult learners and those students are often worried that they're gonna confirm the stereotype that older students can't learn new tricks. So if I'm gonna get through to those students, I have to start with the basics. I have to establish trust. I do that primarily by helping them understand that there are gonna be fair procedures in our class. All students are gonna be treated equally. Students who have questions are gonna get their questions answered. Doesn't matter if they're younger students or older students. And I make sure that they understand that I have confidence in them and that I've seen students just like them before and that I know that they can do it. There are several other things that can be done as well to help reduce stereotype threat in this situation. So for example, it's very important to affirm someone's sense of belonging. 
So I make sure I help those adult learners understand along the way that they're doing fine and that they belong in college and that they're just as bright and just as capable as anyone else. I also like to highlight successful people from their own in-group. So I often share with them stories of other students who have returned to school after many years off. They have families at home. They have full-time jobs. Yet many of those students have gone on to be some of my best students in my stats classes. It's also important for students in this situation to understand that intelligence is not some type of fixed trait, particularly as it applies to any given subject. So although they might not have much confidence right now about something like statistics, they need to understand that with time and with effort, they can get themselves to the point that they feel really very capable. I mentioned that stereotype threat is most likely to occur when a member of a stigmatized group feels that they're surrounded by members of the out group. Well, if that's the case, and older students are really worried about that, I often let them take their exams in the Student Success Center where they feel a little bit more privacy. So overall, there are really several good ways to reduce stereotype threat. All right, well, let's move on. Let's talk about another topic. Let's talk about some ways in which we can control prejudicial and stereotypical thoughts. I love this picture. These kids are being raised in such a way that race will be much less of a factor in how they make sense of other people as they grow older at least compared to those of us who were raised in situations where we didn't have as much interaction with people of other outgroups. But most people weren't raised in this way, where they were given such a great opportunity to get to know so well people from their racial outgroup. But even though we didn't have that opportunity as, as kids, many of us want to go on and treat people as fairly as possible. So sometimes we adopt this type of attitude by saying like, well, I don't see color, I only see people. Perhaps in some hope of treating people in as fair a way as possible. In some ways, people in these situations are probably trying to control their prejudices and their stereotypic thoughts, and some people might even be trying to suppress those thoughts altogether. Well, in general, suppressing stereotypic thoughts is not a wise long-term strategy. I know I've done quite a bit of research on this. The bottom line is that it takes a lot of mental effort. And remember, we only have so many cognitive resources to spare. It takes a lot of attention to try to force some thoughts outside of our awareness. And in general, when you try to suppress thoughts, you're destined to fail. And that's because if I'm trying to keep some type of thought outside of my awareness, there needs to be a part of me, there needs to be a part of my mind that's checking to see if it's working. So in other words, when I'm trying to not think about stereotypic thoughts, there also needs to be a part of my mind that's checking to see, am I thinking about those thoughts that I don't want to think about? You can see it's a really complicated process, and that's why it's destined to fail. And remember, stereotypes are activated automatically, even implicitly. So really, it's an uphill battle. It's a losing battle if we're trying to actively force stereotypic thoughts outside of our awareness. Now that said, we should be motivated to control our prejudices. You know, when I see a picture of Sam Jackson, I want to see him for who he really is. I want to see him as a great actor. I want to see him as a bright guy. I want to see him as insightful. I want to see him as someone who has a nice smile. I don't want to see him as a collection of stereotypes that may or may not describe him as an individual. In other words, I genuinely do not want to be prejudiced. So in other words, I'm motivated not to be prejudiced. Specifically, I'm internally motivated not to be prejudiced because people who are internally motivated are people who do not want to be prejudiced. But people who are externally motivated, they're people who do not want to appear prejudiced. There's an important distinction there. And there's also an important distinction in terms of how successful you will be based on that motivation. But in our quest to control our prejudices, those of us who are internally motivated are going to fail, and we're going to fail often. But as we do, we're going to learn from it, we're going to improve, and we're going to get closer to perceiving people more fairly. So after repeated failures, people who are internally motivated are more likely to control their stereotyping and their prejudice via self-awareness and personal insight. Because as these people fail, they feel guilty. They realize that they have prejudicial thoughts and stereotypic beliefs, and that motivates them to better understand what triggers those thoughts and what triggers those beliefs. And then over time and via self-training, they can develop more appropriate reactions to people who are typically victims of stereotyping and prejudice. In other words, if people are motivated, they can learn to disrupt automatic stereotype activation and implicit biases. I hope you're motivated to do that. And I guess that brings us to our last topic. If you can change your thinking, you can change your culture. You can change your world. 
And in this section, I'm going to ask you to commit to making some positive changes. Keep in mind that stereotypes, prejudices, and negative values are all learned, at least to a large extent. That means you can replace that way of thinking with a much more productive way of thinking. Really, it's up to you. Remember, you have quite a bit of control over your thoughts. Another thing that I ask you to do is practice empathy and perspective taking. Remember, empathy is really understanding how someone feels and then being able to feel how they feel. And perspective taking is all about understanding what someone is thinking from their point of view. If you're practicing empathy and perspective taking, you're more likely to remember the golden rule, which is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And consider challenging racism and discrimination when you see it. Consider becoming a role model for your family and your friends. You'll be surprised how influential you can be. And consider supporting legislation that's fair to everybody. Think about how much change has taken place in our society after new laws have made it official that we in our society needed to do better. Just a couple examples. Think about laws that abolished slavery, laws that provided voting rights to women and minorities, fair housing laws. The direction that our society turns is up to us, my friends. Well, that's it for this section, but stay tuned because there's more social psychology coming up soon.